Good morning, everybody. Is the mic on? Okay, it's on enough. They kept it low because they knew I was coming on. Um, can everybody put up your hands if you're in Bali for the first time? That's amazing. So well done to the organizers to get so many people here for the first time. Um, I'd like to personally welcome you to my island. Uh, I originally come from the north of the island. We're a little, we're a little paler than some of our uh, other people in Bali. Uh, I'm not really, I'm from Canada. But, but welcome anyways. I've been here for nine years, so I almost feel honorary. Um, it's kind of hard to go on after Liam. I think he stole the thunder from every speaker over the next two days by saying that going remote is more impactful than going vegan. Uh, well done. I think that's the line of the conference right there. Um, so I, I'm here just to welcome you and say a few things. Um, over the next few days, we're going to be talking about a lot of things around, as he said, getting started, building, scaling your companies, etc. I know most of the people in this room are um, people that are working for or owning remote companies. Um, so when I thought about what I wanted to say for a couple of minutes before we kick this conference off, what came to me was um, I wanted to talk about the people. So not so much about how you run your company, but what impact that has on the people that are working remotely. So in the last five years of running a co-working space here, we've had around 8,000 members, and the, the universal thing about all of them was they were working remotely. So that's kind of given us at Hubert a really kind of interesting opportunity to see how things have changed, to see the impacts, the struggles, the, the uh, kind of upsides of it. Um, so I'll mention a few things about that today. Um, before I do, I just want to say, um, as, as somebody that's organized a few uh, different conferences in different places, um, you know, it's one of these things where there's always tons and tons of people involved, um, but there is always somebody that, that is kind of like largely responsible for the heavy lifting, um, that doesn't sleep for months leading up to it, that knows the names and where every single person is coming from, um, and that just takes a huge amount of weight and responsibility for putting on a show like this, because this is a show to pull on. Um, and so that person is Igor. Is Igor in the room? Igor, man, this was your moment to shine. Okay, if you see Igor, give Igor a hug. Just do it. He likes hugs. Um, it's not weird. We're in Bali. We can do weird stuff like that. Um, but yeah, Igor has, has really pulled this together. It's been incredible to see the work. And uh, there's been lots of people involved. But really, he is, uh, he is somebody that deserves a hug. What's that? Igor! There he is. Yes. He really, he really does like hugs. Um, so I like talking about work. I, I really do. I'm super passionate about work. I'm a kind of um, unapologetic workaholic. Uh, as much as possible, I try to align what I do on any given day with things that I, I enjoy doing. Um, and I think it's really important um, for everybody because we spend more time working than basically doing anything else as an adult um, other than sleeping. So if you put together um, kind of hanging out with your friends and family, commuting, uh, social events, sex, reading, all that stuff, put it together, it doesn't come close to the number of hours we're gonna spend working uh, as adults. The only thing that comes remotely close, this is a little depressing, spoiler alert, is watching TV. So we either watch TV or we work. Um, so it's right off pretty important to get into something that you enjoy doing. We spend a lot of time getting there. Uh, I know there's a few Australians, uh, a couple of people I met last night from Seattle. Um, so an hour is, is pretty average, certainly in Asia or some of the bigger cities in North America and Europe, that number can creep up higher. So we spend a lot of time just getting to work. We spend a lot of time fighting with our loved ones and ruining our relationships because of work. Um, so working too much uh, is kind of one of the single biggest determinants to relationship strife. So there's a lot of costs that come along with working too much. Liam alluded to that a little bit previously, but I think we can all uh, relate to that, especially if you're running your own company. Um, in Japan, they have a word called karoshi, which refers to the, the uh, phenomenon of spontaneously dropping dead at the office. It's a thing. 10,000 cases per year in Japan. Now, in Japan, they like to work. Um, but my guess is this happens a lot more than people realize. I mean, this sounds a little extreme, but it, it's, it's a real deal. Um, Japan has just been kind enough to give us a word for it. So this is the part that depresses me the most. We spend a lot of time working. We spend a lot of kind of pointless, annoying time getting there. It comes often at great personal cost in our relationships. Um, 
It can be fatal, especially if you're Japanese. Um, and the truth is, most people don't like what they do. Most people spend the majority of their adult lives doing something they don't like, they don't feel connected with. Thankfully, not thankfully, the office is broken. Sorry, Lara, the office is broken. No, it's not broken. There's nothing wrong with offices per se. Um, but there is something wrong with the way that work is set up, that a lot of companies are set up, that priorities are set up, what is um, kind of praised and what is vilified in terms of how we reward people for different types of behavior. Um, the way that we're working, globally speaking, is not working very well. So five years ago or so, we started Hubud. Uh, it's a co-working space here in Bali. For some of you, I know um, you've been coming in this week. Welcome. Um, and we started it because uh, when I moved to Bali nine years ago, the most common story that I heard again and again, and it was partly my story, I, I left a career, um, I worked for the UN for about 10 years, and uh, it was something that I felt passionately for a while, but at some point it stopped, um, it stopped giving me that, that, uh, that feeling of satisfaction. So we came to Bali, we ended up meeting a lot of people um, who told the exact same story. So different countries, different uh, kind of wealth levels, different industries, but a similar thing of being dissatisfied, frustrated, and feeling there was more to life. And so we kind of got this idea around creating a space where people who were, who were curious about living, working, and learning differently could come together and experiment with that. Um, at the time, we were told, um, basically, it was, a, it was a totally rubbish idea. Um, if you're going to do it in Indonesia, you should do it in Jakarta, because that's where the tech scene is. If you're going to do it in Bali, at least do it in Seminyak, where the money is. But for God's sakes, don't do it in Ubud, right? Uh, most of you maybe have heard of or seen Eat, Pray, Love. That's kind of the, the branding of Ubud. It's a place where people come to do yoga. It's a place where people come to get married. To be truthful, it's a place where people come to get divorced. They just don't know it before they get there. Um, it has been uncharitably called Bali. It has been called the place where marriages go, come to die. Um, so people don't... Uh, people don't, didn't really equate the two things. And the question that people asked us was, uh, who would want to work in Bali? You know, who wants to come to Bali to work? And my question at the time was, who wouldn't want to work in Bali, right? Now, I'm not saying Bali is the perfect place. We can talk about that all day long. I don't know that there is a perfect place for everybody, certainly. It's, it's you know, um, places and things we do that give us energy. And the, the kind of, hugely growing trend of remote work is what gives most of these people the ability to, to do this. Um, so uh, I'm a big fan of remote work, mainly because my entire business model is predicated on it. So you know, keep your employees uh, well paid and free. Um, but I'm really interested in, in kind of what it does to, um, to people and, and their lives. So um, I just want to share this. Uh, it's called Meet the New Nomad. So, the term digital nomad is used a lot. I, I'm not entirely convinced of the term. Um, we've heard nomad with a K, K-N-O-W-M-A-D, location independent professional. I know Stu's here somewhere. He really likes this one. Um, Texpats, which is arguably the worst one I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, you were trying to be clever and global, global citizen. And I don't know that new nomad is any better, but I just want to give you a little kind of picture of who we get here and, uh, and what motivates them. Because the more companies I talk to, especially on the HR side, the issue is retention with millennials. It's not that they can't attract them, it's that they can't keep them. Um, and so some of these things that we've seen over the, over the years um, maybe gives a little bit of light in terms of, of what motivates them and who these people are. So this first one, passion and purpose versus survival and obligation, is basically the sharing economy kind of, kind of idea. Um, so people are, are not necessarily, um, as our parents' generation would be, focused on accumulation. Uh, what they're interested in is having kind of meaningful experiences. And they value those um, above kind of what we, you would say is like classical motivators in the employment sphere. And that's very, very, very confusing for big companies. They just, they can't really get their head around that. It's taking them a while. The second is the risk takers. Um, for the most part, by definition, um, over the years, if you have picked up and kind of blown up your life and either started a company, left a career, um, to work halfway around the world, you are a risk taker by almost by definition. 
They value experiences over possessions. Um, so that, that is that kind of same idea um, where they're not necessarily motivated by kind of bigger things, but they want a more rich and meaningful life. Um, lifestyle design, this is a, a, a term, I think Tim Ferriss coined it uh, in the four hour work week. And so essentially this is around intentionality of, of creating the life you want. So for example, if you're a surfer, um, the idea being that you work in an office all year long so that you can save up money to go spend two weeks surfing um, is actually quite preposterous. You should start with that first. So if you're a surfer, go live by the beach and then design your life around how you can support that part of you that's important. Um, they're inspired by movement, um, so the, you know, and that, that has a shelf life, we found, over five years. Um, so the idea, and I, I talked to somebody about this today, Joel, I think it was you, this idea that you, um, at the beginning, you get that laptop and you're like, this is the best thing ever, and, and everybody has the kind of um, almost mandatory picture of the laptop and the sand. Put up your hand if you have a picture of you on the beach or somewhere. Really? I, I, you're lying. Okay. Some of you are lying. We all know it. Um, so there's this, but there is this kind of this uh, kind of uh, trend with it. Let's say so people tend to be inspired by movement, and being versus doing. And now I don't know that this applies all over. Or maybe this is just the, the crowd that gets attracted to um, to Bali, maybe Ubud even in particular. But this idea that um, it is not all about doing and doing, 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 um, actioning, 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 actioning. Um, the idea is they're pulling themselves out of a daily grind that gives them a bit of spaciousness in terms of being able to, uh, to kind of know themselves well, um, think differently about their work. Um, so generally, they're pretty interesting people. Now, people want freedom. We talk about the freedom paradigm. We talk about, uh, and I, I mean, I cringe sometimes at some of the taglines we've used for different campaigns over the years and really kind of like banging the freedom drum. Um, I think the feeling of freedom is important, especially if, if people have lived lives for a long time where they feel very contained. Um, so, you know, on the surface, yes, people want freedom, but more importantly, they need purpose. So, you know, my kind of universal summation of the millennial generation and kind of existential angst that seems to come along with it is millennials feel entitled to work they feel passionately about, that they feel like there's a purpose to it. Um, and that, by the way, is the single most confusing thing to employers, they to typical employers in the, in the corporate world. Um, they just don't get it. But people need to feel connected to the mission. I, I love, Liam, that you put a, a mission statement, a vision statement up about the conference. It is so important. So for you people running remote companies, um, yes, it's important, of course, that, 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 uh, that people feel purpose in any company, you guys might have to work a little harder at it. If your team isn't there every day, if you don't have that opportunity on a day-to-day -day basis to inculcate around the purpose of, of what your company is doing and what you're needing from your employees, then um, you, you have to make sure that they feel this because if they don't, they will leave. So uh, kind of a contrarian view um, that being remote can make people feel more connected than ever before. Um, and you know, there's lots of reasons how, why this is categorically untrue, but I'd say there's equal number that they are true. What I'm referring to in this case is um, it gives people the, the opportunity to feel more connected to things that they care about. That can be their family and family time. We know remote work offers better flexibility and options around that. Could be the ability to connect more to nature. Could be the ability to connect more to experiences that inspire them and motivate them and keep them going. Um, the nice thing is, is you don't have to be their everything. So as companies, um, you know, I think this kind of press with, with like really big tech companies in particular, where they literally are everything. They're their laundromat, they're their cafeteria, they're their social life, they're their work, they're their paycheck. Um, I think the nice thing about being remote is you, you can get a lot of these things in your life and you as employers need to give them awesome work that they feel purposeful around, but you don't need to be there everything. The remote part kind of takes care of that. But you should buy them a co-working membership, um, especially in Bali, no. Um, I think it's really important. So co-working, I, I think the biggest gift of co-working to the world is for the first time in human history, it allows people to choose who they work with. 
So if you think about that 90,000 hours, so people are working and, and um, they might love your company, they might love the work behind it, but they don't necessarily love everybody in your company. You know, I mean, they might like them fine, they might respect them, they might work well with them, but they're not necessarily their people. So for the first time, people get to choose who they spend their time with based on who they are, rather than who's paying their who's paying their wage. So I think co-working spaces have created this, and the advice I always give to people when they say, what should I look for in a co-working space, is go inside, see who's there, and how you feel. The amenities, is it free beer? Is it uh, extra comfy couches and sleep pods? Yes, that's all nice. Ultimately, we're social creatures, and co-working spaces have this ability to make us feel connected and whole. And finally, um, this is related, but it's, it's really so important that I just kind of have to keep banging on about it. Um, uh, obviously, strong company culture is possible for a remote team, but I think you have to work a little harder at it. Um, really, if your company is in 40 countries, if it's different cultures, if you're on different time zones, if there's limited ways, Liam referred to this in some of the kind of downsides of remote work, that's the offset of uh, the, the kind of other side of it. Um, so as employers, as companies, as leaders, you really, need to, you really need to prioritize this, I would argue, more than a typical company does. Um, so that's it. If you are in uh, Bali after this, feel free to drop by Hubud. Uh, we'll do a tour at 12 o'clock on Monday if you're around. Other than that, if you want to drop by, say hello, please do. Uh, and with that, I will leave it there. Say welcome. Have an amazing conference. Um, enjoy this venue. Uh, TEDx was held here, and it was voted uh, one of the top 10 TEDx venues in the world which is incredible considering how many bloody TEDx events there are. So you are really in a very special place on a special island uh, doing special stuff. So welcome. Awesome. Let's give it up for Steve Monroe.